Welcome, Dr. Baffenrotz. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about civil society and peace building tonight. And I have no PowerPoint um, because I thought it's sometimes a bit limiting to have a PowerPoint. So I might tell you what's on the PowerPoint. And if I don't have one, I might tell you what comes into my mind that sometimes more creative, but it might be also more chaotic. And now for your typing, I can't move. No, no, that's fine. I just wanted to know whether it would be good then to, uh, to have the light in I the front. I think it would have a bit yes. of light because then I might not be able to read what I should say. <laughs> and uh, a little bit louder if you don't mind. Yes, mm. okay. you can, you yes can, that's yes, good. Fine. You can hear me in the back? Yes, so a bit louder. Okay, I try hard. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to talk about why should we talk about civil society at all? I mean, that's that's, that's one issue, and um, and of course also why sh why should I talk about civil society? Uh, first of all, in in peace building nowadays, that's in research, but also in the practice, it has become kind of a standard thing. Civil society is important, and there's kind of no question about it. You have states, you have the UN, international organizations, you have civil society, and that's important. And um, the question is, is it like that? And how is it important? Under which conditions is it important? And has it contributed? There has been a lot of support to civil society by different governments in the last 20 years, we can say. And this has been because there has been a shift from an understanding, peace building is something that's brought from outside and then uh, you support kind of the people, the local people, and then they do something with it. But uh, the shift has, I think, uh, come early 90s already, as you know, that it's clear that peace has to come from within, so that's why you should give support from outside to local actors, because they are the ones to build their own peace. So that's kind of the logic why civil society support has been massive in the last 20 years, and we have really seen uh, a rise in civil society support initiatives all over the world. And uh, I think it's the, the, the motivation for me to start looking into civil society more deeply was um, <coughs> on the one hand related to my work in practice in, in different conflict zones where I saw on the one hand very amazing local initiatives where you think like what have people contributed, you saw like local human rights networks, you saw advocacy campaigns, you saw people on the street and you thought like, this is really a contribution to peace. On the other hand, uh, especially when I worked for the European Union as a, as a big donor agency and I had to spend 30 million euros on civil society support, this was really hard. To spend 30 million euros in the Horn of Africa to good civil society initiatives and I tell you the truth, I had a hard time to identify really good initiatives. And whenever I came to other conflict areas, be it like I was involved in the peace process in Afghanistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, in Somalia, you have there's a tendency that you see kind of the same type of civil society organizations who get all the money. And you start asking yourself, what is going on here? Is this sort of a consequence of how the international system functions? Or is this because these organizations are really the good ones? So this kind of um, motivated me to look more deeper into the topic and see like what is behind all the civil society support, but what is also there that is maybe not supported. And what is effective and what is not effective under which conditions. And that was the basis for a big research project we had at the Graduate Institute, which I directed for four years. And the outcome is a, is a big book. You don't have to read it, only if you want to. <laughs> um, but there's a summary of the main results, which is also available on the internet. I can just pass it on, just give it back to me at the end. <laughs> and so this one is, is on the internet. And um, this was a group of 25 researchers involved from 13 universities over four years. And uh, we had a lot of data on what works, what does not work. And not everybody likes the results of our research. Uh, a lot of people do, but a lot of people think it's too critical and it comes at the wrong time. That's what we heard from a lot of international NGOs and presented results that they said, yeah, this is fine, but it's too critical and we are having, we are struggling and getting money from donors and you come along and skip all this critical information. I think it depends on how you read it, but what I want to 
give you is a couple of more details about how civil society works and functions, what does not work, what works and why, and then open up for questions and debate. I try to be not too long so that we have uh, more space for debate. Maybe first um, to see, I mean, what is this, this is civil society? And um, let's say historically, civil society, and that's a big debate, comes from European enlightenment, how European citizens have sort of tried to uh, differentiate themselves towards the state and have understood like um, what's the difference between society basically and the state. This was this whole, you know, John Locke, uh, Tocqueville, all these philosophers who have come up with, uh, with all sorts of theories about um, how the society should be separate from the state because that was not the case before. Because of this um, European Enlightenment thinking, there was there's a lot of debate. Is the concept of civil society applicable to non-European societies? And um, in a way, there's still I, we have a big project at the moment with the civil society movements in the Middle East have taken part in the Arab Spring, and we have a series of consultation, and we end up always in this: Is it a concept? Can we really apply it? I find it a rather difficult the debate because civil society is just a reality. Uh, where you are, it depends just who you define as civil society. So if you say uh, the Muslim Islamic charities are no civil society, then you can say, okay, there might be no civil society in the Arab world. But of course, um, it is about how citizens organize themselves for interests and this is civil society. I mean, we have in European soci societies, um, I mean, you have uh, the churches, you have the unions, you have professional associations, all this is civil society. Interestingly, if you go to conflict countries and you ask a donor who's civil society, he or she will name you the main uh, middle class urban NGOs that work in the capital. And they don't talk about unions, they don't talk about professional associations, which is interesting because in Europe this is the main thing we understand when we talk about civil society. And it's also often that from a kind of Western point of view, a lot of actors, they don't see, um, let's say, non-liberal actors. Let's say um, more if the uh, Buddhist monks during this peace process in Sri Lanka came on the street and demonstrated against the peace process, then there was a tendency to say, no, these are the bad guys. They are not civil society. Civil society are the good guys who are for the peace process. And I find this... Um, it's a very tricky understanding of civil society because if we just define what we think is right or wrong as civil society, and I think there has been a tendency, especially with Western donors, to see civil society is good. It is those good people who love peace and we have to support them. And of course it's true. This is one part of civil society. But it's very difficult when we do peace work to forget that there are others. And if we ask the Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka, Certainly they are for peace, but they might not share the values we have or the way we think peace is to come. They have a very nationalist, absolutely, um, you can say, particular approach to peace building, but it's very, I think it's, it's sensitive and it's not appropriate to say they are wrong and we are right. They have a different understanding and we might not share it. But we have to understand that this is, there is this variety and civil society is like society. So everything that is in society is also in civil society. And I think that's the, a crucial point. In theory, there is a distinction between this is like the state and that means the government. But we say also this, the, the political arena is also, let's say, the political parties, parliament and all this. This is all part of the political arena. And then you would have business. This kind of doesn't work. You have the business, and then, and then you have the private <coughs> family. And let's say a more modern understanding of civil society would be that civil society is here, because, and I think that's important. There are of course overlaps. If I am, let's say, a journalist, I'm a journalist. I work for a media publishing house. So part of me is a business, because my media publishing house is also there to make business. 
But as a journalist, of course I'm part of family, I have a family. Um, but I'm also here because I might be a member of a journalist association that uh, lobbies for pre press freedom. And I think that is a very, I think, good understanding of civil society. And I might be actually a member of a political party in sort of in my evening life, where I lobby for certain principles in my political party. Of course, if I, as a member of my political party, would be elected and join the government, I'm out of civil society. But it's very interesting if you have this approach to see how things overlap. And also the reality in many countries, in, in many conflict countries, uh, is of course that um, like uh, the peace process in, in DRC Congo, you had for the first time a representation of civil society at the negotiation table. That was the first time that civil society was really at the table. If you looked who sit there, took a closer look, who is actually sitting there, you would find a lot of business people there. And they were, let's say, part of their business associations, and they were, of course, also the cousin of the minister so-and-so, and then, of course, they were the brother of so-and-so, and if you looked at it in detail, because it was a great failure, the support, a civil society contribution to the peace process in DRC, contrary to other examples which I'll give you later. But if you analyze why it failed, it's simply as that. Because there was not really civil society. There were all sorts of people who were also in civil society, but their main head was somewhere else. And that is very, very good to have this sort of lens, like, who is it exactly? And this is also something, when you see support from outside, that's not really looked at. It's just, these are the good ones, and they are for peace, and we're going to support them. And afterwards, there comes all these surprises, like, why did the support not work and all this? And I think it's very much related to a bit of a romantic view what civil society is. But it's, of course, also clear, let's say, the good guys and girls are also there. I'm not saying that civil society is all bad, not at all. But it's just diverse. And, of course, another dimension of civil society is that power relations, hierarchy, gender. I mean, what we found is... 98% of all civil society organizations are sort of run by a male individual from the dominant class or caste or ethnic group in a country. 2% are run by women and minority groups, and the women and minority groups lobby either for gender issue, for women inclusion, or for minority inclusion. But the 98 are sort of the dominant the dominant class in society. So you, you cannot say civil society is, it's just like society. That's it basically. Um, just maybe on um, one example of a region like in Africa, there's a lot of debate in research. Is civil society a concept for Africa or, or is it just not working because Africa is not having classical European middle class settings, workers, movement and all this? Um, as I said, there are different opinions on it, but I think it winds down to say if you think that civil society has to be urban and has to be coming out of European standards, then there is none. If you think civil society is a broader concept, and you also have traditional entities, you have youth clubs and all this. Like I give you an example in Liberia, you have a lot of in other African countries as well, listener clubs. People, um, they call in when there are radio shows and they have listener clubs and they form opinions and then they, they give it back sort of to the radio for calling in. It's very popular. And you can say that's also a form of civil society. If you have uh, the traditional elders meet and decide, this is also civil society. However, if the elders are linked to the government, which you have in many countries, uh, you have to also make a distinction, like how far they are civil society or how far they are sort of members of the state. Anyhow, um, there is uh, this other notion what we hear in research a lot, uncivil society, just to mention it. So civil society has it to be civil. Is it a precondition? that groupings come together and they're also civil. In political science, it's quite clear, yes, at this moment you use violent, you're not part of civil society. So that's kind of an attribution. 
Um, but what is often discussed under the term uncivil society might be also groups that um, not necessarily use violence, but that definitely are not, let's say, using liberal values. So it's, um, if you have radical, um, let's say, um, is part of the civilian wing of radical Hamas, is that civil society? You can debate it. But certainly, if it's an organized interest group of people who come together for a common cause and they don't use violence, yes, there would be. But of course, the American government would say, no, this is Hamas, this is a militant uh, Islamist group. Um, so of course, there are different opinions, but we have to be careful on that. And uh, in my definition, definitely, they would be included. <laughs> And that's why I don't use the term uncivil society, because it gives you this kind of, these are the good ones, the civil, and these are the uncivil. I think we can make a good distinction between violence and non-violence. There are people who think the Taliban are a civil society movement because they started as a civil society movement, which is true, but they from the beginning said violence is a means of our fight. So by that I would exclude them, but others would include them. And so this is like a debate. Um, I would like you, so as I said already, when we look into actors, it becomes very complicated. Is this actor in, is this actor out? In order to avoid this, uh, what I use is a so-called functional approach to civil society, where I look into what is civil society doing instead of who is civil society. I'll give an example, and then I walk you through seven functions of civil society. Um, when we studied uh, the Nepal case study in our, we had 13 case studies in this, in this book, and Nepal was one of them. And what we saw when we uh, looked into the research material, what was already there, what do we know about civil society, then you would see a tendency in research to have grouping about who are the peace organizations in the country and what are they doing. But what we were interested in, what is done for peace? And then we see who does it. And with the functional approach, and I'm coming to that, you would, what we found in Nepal during the war, one of the most active groups was the forest user associations. Who, who would have thought the forest users are doing something for peace? And this is what you see very often. If you just look at it, who is doing something for peace, you find many more groupings and if you say, where is civil society that we can support in, for peace building? So what we have identified, um, and I'm not going into the theoretical background of it, but what we have identified is seven functions where you can see this is what civil society can do for peace building. And uh, it's also other actors who can do it. So the first function is protection. My handwriting is a bit... Not so nice, I'm sorry. <laughs> Protection is the first function, which of course necessarily is not necessarily only done by civil society. Um, but protection is a function of civil society actually performed a lot. In the local context, you will find um, citizens basically uh, protecting other citizens. You will find uh, active human rights organization. Um, you find organizations, international organizations like the ICRC, who would support uh, the, local, uh, I, the, the local Red Cross, or you find all sorts of protection initiatives. During war, you often find them as um, very much around security and human rights. So these are often the main issues where people try to protect. So it's a protection from violence. And it's quite interesting that protection is very unpopular uh, in the peace field, besides like Peace Brigades International. I think that, that, that's a good example. But most money doesn't go to protection. Uh, it's like, oh, these are kind of the human rights people, and we are kind of the peace people. So this protection is for them, so for us. But in fact, protection very often is the starting point of, of peace initiatives. Like in, um, you had in El Salvador during the war, you had the churches who were lobbying for uh, a free zone, a free day of fighting because they wanted to vaccinate the children. And uh, it made a really change of mind when the churches negotiated days. And then suddenly the people said, but if these people can just stop fighting, I mean, why, why don't you just stop forever? It's ridiculous. If they just stop for vaccination, they can also stop that people are not killed. The same happened in Mozambique during the war. 
when the Red Cross negotiated free zones for, for the people to, to, to be able to come to these zones and sort of get treated because they were injured. And this also massively speeded up uh, the process. In Nepal you had a similar thing. You had local human rights organizations who were connected with Amnesty International and uh, they and Amnesty then lobbied internationally for a UN mission, in, a protection mission for human rights. It came then, it was the ever biggest human rights protection mission the UN ever had. And we, we can't say this brought peace, but we can say it definitely speeded up the process because the, part, the conflict parties suddenly were watched. You had the whole country full of observers and everybody in civil society was feeding information into the UN mission. So we see that protection is a, is a very important function in peace building. And we have seen two types of organizations who were um, pretty successful in protection. And that were either professional protection NGOs, or these were very, very local groups that never received any international support, but were in their local context really uh, supporting local peace zones or negotiating with the warlords or whatsoever. The second function is monitoring. Sure. That is. You can read it? Yeah, I, I've tested them all already, so <laughs> these are the best we have at the moment. Okay, I'm trying. So monitoring, the second function, is um, during war it's a lot, again, monitoring of human rights violations, later it's monitoring of ceasefire arrangements, it is also monitoring of the peace agreement itself, how is it implemented and so. You would say also, again, here, those functions can also be performed by other actors, not only. Like here, if you have, like we found in Cyprus, there was no civil society protection going on. And we were wondering, why is that? And then there is a big, big UN un uh, mission that is there to protect people. That's why. So it's very often when you do this analysis that you have to see what are the others doing. The same for monitoring. If you have a monitoring mission in a country, it's very likely that this is sort of doing the main bulk of the work. But what we see in monitoring that civil society organizations are often the ones providing the international actors with the information, linking the local level with the international level. And monitoring is also a very crucial task. And interestingly also, monitoring receives hardly any money. Very little money goes into monitoring. In conflicts, you see in the beginning of a conflict, you would see some local activities in monitoring. When a conflict goes over for a longer time, uh, you will find more monitoring, often done by faith-based organizations that have sort of a, a normative notion of monitoring supports protection, so we want to do something. And then you either have an agreement in a peace agreement that monitoring is part of the agreement. If it's not, you will see very little monitoring. Guatemala is an interesting case. In Guatemala is one of the cases where there was a very heavy civil society involvement during the peace process. And uh, civil society was so successful that they um, made about 80% of the proposals that should be included into the agreement were actually put into the agreement. We did an assessment of 10 years after the peace agreement. How many of those sort of uh, protocols that were included were actually implemented? And it was uh, about 10%. Um, that means 80% they managed to get into the agreement and about 3 to 4% of the 80 were implemented. Because this were, of course, at the heart of the conflict. It was about rights for indigenous groups, land rights, the issues that were afterwards not tackled. And it's quite interesting to see that also civil society, after the peace agreement, didn't do any monitoring. Nobody kind of shouted, like, why is that not implemented? And we have fought, they fought so hard to get it into the agreement, and then it's not implemented. And that's a strong weakness in many peace agreements, that monitoring mechanisms are, are not good. A good example for a good monitoring mechanism is the uh, peace agreement in Liberia, the last one, where you had also very heavy civil society involvement, and you know that uh, Lemma Barre, she got the Nobel Peace Prize for when she was one of the activists in that. And uh, what they also lobbied is that in the peace agreement there are um, uh, requirements that civil society has to be included into monitoring mechanism after the, for the implementation of the agreement. And that's a, quite a, a big mechanism in that agreement. 
And there's also a provision in the North Island uh, peace agreement on monitoring and civil society involvement. But we see when it's not in the agreement, it's very often not done afterwards. And interestingly, Kofi Annan in the post-election violence in Kenya, he um, wanted monitoring of the implementation of the agreement and he talked to George Soros and asked him whether he would fund it and he agreed. And then he organized two civil society organizations in Kenya. They actually published twice a year a monitoring report. It's quite interesting. You will not find any mentioning of that report in the press in Kenya. It's, it's deliberately sort of not talked about, but it's public. I mean, it's in the internet. You can download it. Very good reports. But it's like, not everybody wants to hear what's in the report. Uh, there was a, a similar thing in Sri Lanka where the donor uh, peace support group um, was trying to do, or they did actually, they, they uh, recruited one civil society uh, group that was a research center in Colombo and they did regular analysis of the peace process, shared it with the donor community, but the donor community didn't do much with it. They were kind of listening, they were very interesting, right, thank you very much. And there was no kind of political activity behind it to say, let's do something with it. So it's very much linked to how you deal with it, how, how strong sort of the, the effect of it is. Um, advocacy is the number three. Does it keep getting better? Advocacy is one of the core functions of civil society, traditionally. And um, that includes like we distinguish three types of advocacy. Massive advocacy on the streets, like Arab Spring. You have everybody on the street, like you had it, of course, Arab Spring is the most recent and popular example. You usually get people massively on the street for two reasons. That's either end of war or end of authoritarian rule. So away with the dictator and violence. These are usually the only sort of moments when you get really massively people on the street. We have seen that in Nepal, we have seen that in Serbia, we have seen that in the Arab Spring, and that's the strongest thing that civil society can do. So, and that usually has the biggest effect, but it's of course a momentum, and what we also see is the momentum goes down. And then it really depends like how good is civil society organized in order to Keep, keep the momentum. What we also have is targeted advocacy campaigns, usually of professional NGOs, where we see like uh, in the Bosnian peace agreement, um, uh, women's organizations lobbied for having um, sort of uh, something on women's rights integrated into the agreement. That's then usually involving the press, a really professional campaign. Um, interestingly also, not so much money goes into that one. But I tell you where the money goes. That's in the next two functions. Point five. And that's what we call socialization. Socialization. Okay. I'm explaining it a little. And the other one is social cohesion. These are kind of very political science terminologies. I'm coming to it. So this is everything which socializes people for peace. Uh, peace education, training courses in culture of peace, um, uh, yeah, basically broad-based inclusion of a culture of peace, of peace thinking into the society right large. Social cohesion is everything, I mean Putnam distinguished between this, this is like bonding and this is bridging. So social cohesion is bringing groups together, but there's a difference. I just put you number six, just to see the difference, there's facilitation. So facilitation, I mean, when you do like mediation facilitation, you really bring like the parties together to negotiate an agreement that can be a local agreement, can be a national agreement, but that's not social cohesion. Social cohesion is when you bring the groups together so they understand each other better. Like all these people to people uh, projects you had after the Oslo Peace Agreement. Um, in, in especially in so-called identity conflicts, you had like Cyprus, Sri Lanka, North Island, Israel, Palestine, when you have like two groups that are at least perceived to hate each other, put it like that, 
and and then bring them together. And that, I mean, you know this. This is like, um, this is, these are the number one of activities where all the money goes that comes from outside. Um, you would have, and you have a particular time in the peace process when all the money comes, and that's usually after uh, a ceasefire agreement, after a peace agreement, like Oslo, you had the Sri Lanka, the ceasefire agreement, then massive support comes. So now's the end of violence, now we have to bring the group together, and the theory of change, so the idea, how does it work behind this, is like groups, they have been like indoctrinated, by their leaders and by society, that they don't like each other and they have images of the other. You have heard this probably a thousand times. And you bring them together and they will change this image and they become friends and they change their attitude, which means finally they will change their behavior. While socialization targets the individual more directly, that it doesn't say you have to now uh, don't think about this person like an enemy, it's more like what is peace all about and how could I behave as an individual. All right, what I'm, what I'm doing now is I finish this up and then I tell you what are the impacts of these different functions on peace building, what has worked under which conditions and what not. The last one is what we call service delivery. This is a function coming more from humanitarian aid and development. And we had long debates when we started the project. <coughs> is this a function in peace building or not? And we couldn't, we couldn't answer it. So we said, OK, let's test it. And the result was quite clear. Yes and no. <laughs> yes. If organizations deliberately use service delivery as an entry point for peace building, it can be quite powerful. If they don't, it's not. Examples. I mean, this you have the whole idea of do no harm and local capacities for peace for those who know is behind that. But what was interesting for us was there was a lot, and those who know this project of Mary Anderson and Do No Harm, which uh, said like eight organizations do a lot of conflict uh, and they don't know really what they do, but if they build local capacities for peace, they can contribute. And if you are part of a kind of an international expert community of peace builders, your problem, and mine in that case also, is you are among your own group. You constantly meet people who have the same educational background, the same thinking, like um, probably in this room we hardly find anybody who says like war is the answer. And so we are constantly among ourselves and we feel quite comfortable among ourselves. And uh, we kind of lose track that we are not the only ones. And uh, for me, it was quite astonishing after years and years that really uh, this uh, group around Mary Anderson, CDA, has tried to do do no harm training and they had contracts with so many aid agencies in the world so that we thought something has really changed. And we were really astonished when we came to countries like Sri Lanka, which was one of their core countries, and there were so many aid agencies who had so heard nothing about this and who were just doing business as usual. And what we saw is basically one to two percent of aid organizations are aware that they can do something for peace. Most of them are either not aware or they deliberately say, this is not our mandate, we don't want to do that. Especially humanitarian organizations think that this is not in their mandate when they are in a conflict zone, they should not also report, for example, monitoring about the violence because this mixes up with their mandate. What we have seen, let me walk back in terms of effectiveness, what works. Service delivery works especially well on social cohesion after violence has ended. I'll give an example in Bosnia. When you talked about reconciliation in Rwanda or in Bosnia, you could go home also. People said, this is not it. After what has happened, we don't want to reconcile. This is maybe your idea from outside, but we can't. We can maybe think about living together, but reconciliation is a non-starter. And that was a problem, and is still for many peace organizations, who come and say, this is our project, we want to help you to reconcile, please all come together. They might come if you pay them sitting allowances and you know, 
this kind of things. Depends on the, I mean, on the level of the sitting environments. When I was working for Adorna, I often came to training courses and there, was, there were no trainees. And then I said to the NGOs, I'm sorry, I mean, we are paying for this training, where are the people? And they would say, well, you know, this other organization, they paid double the sitting allowance, so they're all there. That's, it's, a, it's, a routine, it's a sad thing, but it's a routine problem. Uh, the worst I have seen recently was in Juba, in South Sudan, where there was a real battle going on for sitting allowances and participants of conflict resolution training courses. And most of the American organizations won the battle, the battle. So, actually, it sounds like a bad thing. If you put yourself into a local person that has survived the war, and main interest is survival, I think it's pretty fair. It's pretty fair. It's a source of income. And that's it. So the problem, I think, is not on the side of the local people who are there for the sitting allowances, but on the side of the aid agencies who are not able to coordinate themselves and to think about what they are doing when they are sort of giving these type of allowances. All right, if you have, in Bosnia, coming back to that example, you had quite successful projects that were bringing in, for example, conflict resolution training for local mediators to uh, facilitate the homecoming of refugees. So very concrete, very precise, they had a task. What we saw, when you did conflict resolution training without a, a, a real task, where it was clear this training is for this purpose, then it had very, very little effect. Participants of training courses will say, I learned a lot. Especially, I'm not beating up my wife anymore after the, since the training, or I talk to my children differently. And you say, are you, work, are you using it in your work? And people say, we can't connect. We, we don't really know what this training has to do with our work. When the training was very concrete, work-related, like you talk about, you give training to teachers about nonviolence in schools and how they can reduce violence, then it had an effect. But the sad thing is, most of this kind of culture of peace and conflict resolution training were standard training courses, which organizations do in all countries. They were not very context sensitive and they were often not having a particular goal because the logic behind most training is you do the training and everybody will just love it and change their lives. And it's usually not the case. I mean, if you have been socialized as a hardline Protestant in Northern Ireland and you go to a five-day training, but you have been 30 years of going to a nationalist, a radical Protestant school. Your parents talk since you are born that all the others are less just, just better dead. You think you really change in five days. Okay, now you could argue, okay, we do 100 days. Interestingly, what we, what we saw, and that's the reason why many, or let's say we found 95% of these type of projects do not work. Because what we did is, in Cyprus, in these big identity conflicts, Cyprus, Israel, Palestine, Sri Lanka, Northern Ireland. So we had um, done uh, these uh, control groups of people who were, let's say, people go to the training, you interview them before the training, you interview them afterwards and a year afterwards, to see, like, that's the whole idea. If you do a good monitoring, what most organizations also don't do, but if they do, they will find out how has it before, after, and a year later. All right. What we did is we also worked with control groups. That means we, we interviewed people who were invited to come to the training, but they couldn't make it, or the list was full. And then you had a random control group. Now, interesting. The people who went to the training, before the training, they would say, we go to this training because we think it's good to work with the other side. The people who were invited but couldn't come say, we really wanted to come to this training because we believe in coexistence, we want to talk to these people. The random control group says, this is nonsense. I mean, you should not talk to these people. So after the training, there was of course hardly an attitude change because the people were already converted before they came to the training. And that was the average training, which means peace organizations tend to work with like-minded people and not with hardline constituencies. Yeah, of course, I mean, who would like to work with hardline constituencies? It's also not easy. It is more awareness now 
in the last years we have seen more projects <coughs> trying to address, but it's still the, minor the minority. Usually, dialogue projects preach to the converted. Or else, they bring together, like you have seen that in Sri Lanka, a lot exchange between schools from the Tamil and the Sinhalese uh, areas. And you, we interviewed eight agencies who had supported the project, and they were all saying this was really big success. And we said, how do you measure success? They say, yeah, people came together, they had fun together, they played together. And we said, did you ask the parents? And did you ask the children a year later? Of course they didn't. But if you do, of course, it is the problem with it is, it is no problem to like a person individually. People go to these courses, even the people who, who, who had a negative opinion, they would say, I'm a Palestinian um, and Fatma, and Fatma says like, my, this Leila, she's my friend after this training, and I'm happy that I met her. But all the other Arabs, mm. I mean, just kill them. But Leila is good. <coughs> and that's the problem. You change, sort of, you don't change the structures. The problem is, what, what is that what works here? Most projects work on peace education in extra curriculum activities in the afternoon and you can choose between football or peace education. Or, uh, th this is reality. Instead of working with the schools, with the structure, changing the structure or discussing why are old schools segregated. The, 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 the children have no chance to meet each other in a daily routine because if I'm a Protestant, I don't send my child to a school that is integrated if I'm not already converted. So naturally, you will find in Sri Lanka only segregated school. The international school is maybe the only one that's not, but you even find international schools that are segregated. So the same in Northern Ireland. So the problem is the structure and the socialization and the families. And that's why all these programs have to include families. But the, the biggest effect we have seen is when they start, try to change structures, but that is a very, very long-term thing, of course. You have to really work with the schools, change the curriculum, do teacher education. And the, the problem with most of uh, the training courses was it starts on a very low individual level and doesn't think about like what is needed for change. So the problem is that the peace community is very fixed on certain theories of why and how change comes. Change comes if we bring together the good people and we have to do dialogue projects and reconciliation. This is linked to a number of theories we are getting when we study peace studies, which are all right. And I'm not saying that conflict resolution or conflict transformation theories are wrong. What we are saying is they are definitely not sufficient to make us understand what is there and how to make peace. So this is only within the functions. Let me move beyond the functions. Um, but maybe to not only be so negative. As I said, if you link these two functions, and if you find uh, give an example, Israel Palestine. There was a there were good and successful projects uh, on discussing the water problems uh, related to the Jordan River uh, with different civil servants in the different communities in Palestine and Israel. There was a very successful project on social cohesion, bringing together the city councils uh, in Jerusalem from the east and the west part of the city, negotiating um, administrative things where none of them ever changed their attitude. They all were convinced that the other ones are not worth it. But all of them changed their behavior. And all of them said, we can very well work with these people and it's very effective to have these joint groups. And we saw this also on teacher councils in Sri Lanka and all this. So what we learned from this is, the idea is not about attitude change, it's about behavior change. The most interesting example is actually there is um, public opinion polls since uh, the end of World War II in Holland about how Dutch people like German people. And they're very constant. 
All Germans are. <laughs> okay, it, it was a slight change after the World Soccer Championship, <laughs> where Germany won a little bit of points. But the interesting thing is, would you think that Dutch and German peoples have problems in making business and being friends? Of course not. It's a historical narrative that you have to hate the Germans, and rightly so, maybe after the experience of World War II. But it, it's not a problem, and so the point is that in the peace community there is still, and it's changing now, but there is still this thing about attitude change. You have to really, you come out of this and you have to love the other side. But that's, it doesn't matter, people don't have to love each other, they just don't have to kill each other and work together and be together and live together. So I think that's, that's what we learn about a lot of these projects. I'm coming to another point that sounds boring, but it's very important. It's context. It's a very standard thing. Context matters, but it's, it's more complicated. Um, so what is crucial? If you read any donor document on peace building, it will always start with context matters. Context first. If you go into the field and analyze how agencies analyze the conflict, you would find a real um, improvement in the last 15 years of very lousy or non-existent analysis to good, medium good, until sophisticated analysis. So we have really, through all the training courses, master programs, what we all have in the world, we have a, a super improvement in conflict analysis these days. And you know, many donor, every has, everybody has their own conflict analysis frameworks. I'm often asked, like, which one should I use? I say, I don't care as long as you do it. Um, but there's a tragedy behind it. The tragedy is what we see, no matter how good the context analysis is, it has hardly any impact on what activities are done. <laughs> so everybody analyzes the context, but they then keep on doing dialogue and peace education projects. And that's really interesting. That when you are, I'll give you an example from Sri Lanka. Um, there was a training on um, peace education for, for media people, for journalists. And that was designed in a time when there was uh, still negotiation going on. And you could think like, yes, that's extremely important because also what we found is in our research, Media. Media is a key factor, positive and negative, because how the media, for example, bring advocacy campaigns, how the media frame the conflict, this is like a, a, a massive influence on the conflict. So the media is an important context factor. So working with the media is no doubt a good thing. So what happened with the project is, um, they continued peace education while people were massively killed. Journalists were killed. They were uh, because of the way they were starting to write. And at that time, we asked them, like, how can you do this? And they said, but peace education is important. We just said media is important. We said, but now it's time to protect these people. The only thing what you need to do is protection. And that is really a weakness in many programs that they don't work with a changing context. So you have a brilliant context analysis, but you don't have analysis, what I call scenario development, where you say, okay, how can the conflict change? And what do you do with your conflict when the conflict changes? And if I do a, a media, a journalist project, and I don't have a, an understanding of if the situation goes wrong, I need to take the money, talk to my donor, and put it in a protection fund and bring them all out of the country. So, and this is, you will rarely see this in project design, that people really think through, and every student we tell, conflict is, is something that's changing, it has different phases, but all the documents we see are making a picture instead of a movie. I'm always telling my student it's a movie, and you have to be prepared how the movie goes on. And like in Sri Lanka, we had actually, uh, I supported the Norwegian and the Swiss government in, in Sri Lanka and we've done numerous workshops on developing scenarios. When we said, what about total war? 
the Norwegians said, this is not going to happen. So we don't have to think about it. And, that's, and everybody in the donor community agreed everything is possible, but not a military victory. And that's exactly what happened. And nobody was prepared. And because nobody was prepared, the same things were continued. And um, so I think that's really, that's not responsible piecework. If we don't think it through, and we have to <coughs> confront ourselves with the fact that conflicts usually go wrong. And that's what happened also with many dialogue initiatives. They were absolutely right, like uh, at a certain stage of the process, but there were maybe the wrong interventions when the conflict changed. The whole logic of intervention in Israel-Palestine today is built on wrong theories of change. And the whole donor community knows it. There's some interesting research study recently coming out that tried to analyze why is it like that? Why is everybody in denial of the situation? But you have that quite often, actually, and um, in the Sudan peace process, for example, um, there's a complete focus on the North-South conflict. And everybody ignores all the other conflict lines. Of course, when they come up, Blue Nile, Kordofan, everybody runs to them. But there's a complete sort of denial that we will know that this government has a particular policy. We will know that a thousand conflicts will come up in the South. Nobody talks about it. And um, so there are certain narratives how the conflict is seen, and this is continued, and that's why certain interventions are there and others are not. And it's very important. It's why I often say peace work is not easy work. And it's not only easy because this, the situation is complicated. You will get a lot of resistance. And a good peace builder is prepared to face resistance and to fight resistance. And that you can do in every organization when you work. Sometimes when I was a lot in Somalia and my kids were little, they always tell me, why are, why are you going all the time away? And you're not achieving anything. So they were my earliest evaluators. <laughs> and they said, so today, I mean, what have you achieved? They're still born in Somalia. You have done nothing. And I said, at least I have hindered at least 25 stupid peace initiatives. So this is what I can at least say what I've done in Somalia. And I spent a great deal of my time in hindering stupid peace initiatives. You can't imagine how many irresponsible peace initiatives are coming every day. And it's, it's really, really uh, interesting. Put it like that. Let's go into the context. And then I'm trying to come to an end. And I have, to, I have to bring you something positive to not leave you in a situation of frustration, I know. Um, it is an interesting, when we look into the context, what really matters are the following factors. Media, we said, violence. Interestingly, violence is a greatly ignored component in peace building. Because we assume violence is there and we are then there to, to, to bring peace and we try to stop it and to end violence. Okay. But usually violence also comes in cycles. And if you look into documents of organization, violence is greatly ignored. In the donor community, you, people in Afghanistan today say, there is no problem with violence. It's just partially taking place in a number of areas. And you would say, like, well, it's unfortunately 80% of the country. But the same is in Somalia today. Oh, we have secured, now we have uh, conquered Kismayo, and we are already in uh, Mogadishu, and we have secured this, and what about the rest of the 80% of the country where Al-Shabaab is controlling, and where you have violence going on? What we saw, civil society, what civil society can do, is crucially uh, affected by the level of violence. So the more violence, very simple correlation, the more difficult it is. Which means, you cannot just support civil society when there's a lot of violence. You have to think about what else you need to do. You need to put pressure on the governments to end violence. So sometimes, I remember after the Arab Spring, we had a lot of requests from different governments we're working with. What should we do? We want to do something for civil society. And we said, it's not the time. You have to put pressure on these governments. That they stop violence against their people. That's all you can do. That's the best you can do. And it's often used as an escape goat to support a nice civil society initiative because you don't want to face the government. Remember the whole debates when we had the, the war in, in Libya, how long it took uh, to get a mobilization there. And if you talk to the activists from Libya, they will say, we 
could, we would be all dead without the international intervention. Why are you even discussing it? We don't understand this. But of course we have also to talk about external violence. It's clear, we have to. I'm just saying this is an important point. What's the most important factor influencing? That's actually the government and the state. Depending how a government and the state reacts, civil society has space or no space. The App Spring is a very good example. You saw how the government on Tahrir uh, Square in Egypt reacted. The military didn't kill uh, the demonstrators. Look at Syria, look at Libya. So we see, look at Bahrain. So how the government reacts will determine how sort of the immediate stage in the transition goes. So from a perspective of how do you support civil society, you can't leave out the government. Of course, if you are an NGO, you might not be able to do something with the government, but you can lobby your own government, that your own government does something or not. So what I'm saying is civil society support cannot be just seen as this is a project, this is an initiative. It has to be framed in a comprehensive way that really tackles this thing. And there's one other thing I wanted to share, two other things. The regional actors and the international actors. What we found actually, these ones are extremely powerful. I'll give you an example. When the big civil society movement was on the street in Nepal against the war, against the king, this happened before. It was in 2001 the first time, and the next time in 2004. And the 2001 one was unsuccessful, while the next one was successful. Why? Because at the second time when the people were on the street, the Indian government has decided to change its policy vis-a-vis -vis the, the king and the government of Nepal. And have said, if you not giving up power, we're not going to support you military and political anymore. And the US government said, and we are on board with the Indians. While in 2001, the Indian government said, we are behind the king and the government. So often people say it was a big, big success of the movement. It was, but it couldn't have happened without this. The same is an interesting example is the Kurdish conflict in Turkey, where you had uh, the Turkish government not allowing any civil society activities in the Kurdish area besides humanitarian aid. Nothing else was allowed. And when Turkey uh, made, uh, wanted to start, or is in the process now, of joining the European Union, the European Union made a list of things, of conditions they have to fulfill. One of this, and this was based on active policy lobbying of Kurdish diaspora groups in the European Parliament to say the Kurdish issue has to be on the table and you have to allow uh, civil society organizations to freely operate. And if you don't do, you should forget membership. So this pressure from the European Union, in combination with what they also did, is put a fund for civil society support up. So this combination of the diaspora groups pressuring the European Parliament, the European Parliament pressuring the European Union, and then putting a fund completely re relaxed the situation and suddenly civil society was allowed to move freely in the Kurdish area. So you see how governments and actors react creates the preconditions for civil society to operate. And that's a key problem in many initiatives that they don't, they just think unilateral in this is my project and I'm gonna support it. It's a complete ignorance of how the context is there. What we also found is, yeah, let's take Israel-Palestine. Often people in dialogue projects are very frustrated because they feel like I don't have a problem with Israelis. I have a problem with the Israeli government. And it's the, the, the point is, you can't say that everything is a relationship problem between people. It's a hardcore political conflict about interests and power. And what we have seen, that's an interesting thing in the Northern Ireland conflict. I mean, it's when you do public opinion polls, there's still Protestants and Catholics today have problems with each other. But when the leaders came together and signed the, the Good Friday Agreement, this was the starting point that you could do something in society. So it was the preconditions that the leaders came together and then society will follow. 
at a certain stage if you create the conditions. But if you say it's only about the relationships, it's just not reality. Okay, what are the consequences for peace work? I'm not talking about theory consequences, so who is interested, I can send you some papers on that. The consequences are, as you already see from that, is really that we think in comprehensive support strategies. And that we also stop thinking about who are, who are the peace people who are doing dialogue and peace education. But to say, where are the groups that are doing what? And what is needed? Is monitoring needed? Is advocacy needed? Is protection needed? How can we combine it with something else? What else needs to be in place? And then, who can do it? And what can I do in my organization? to lobby for things to happen. You don't have to be this clear, not everybody can do everything. But we can be aware of it, we can, we can make advocacy for certain things, and we have to resist stupid peace initiatives. And we have to lobby for that a reality-based understanding of peace and conflict is there, and not just that we wish should be there, but to really acknowledge what is there on the ground. Thank you very much.